thank you for holding. Now you're on the air. My name is Dan O'Day, and that other guy there is Harlan Hogan. Name? Yeah. Harlan Hogan. <laughs> and once a year, we uh, produce a class called Starting Your Voiceover Business, Everything You Need to Know to Turn Your Dream or Your Sideline into a Business. You'll find all the information at thevoiceoverclass.com. And we are closing registration at the end of this week, so just two or three more days of registration. And we know that there are a lot of people who they already know they want to join the class, but they're feeling scared or they need reassurance or they want to make sure they want to make sure of what they'll be getting and if it's right for them in the first place. And so we're doing this free teleseminar, open-ended Q&A to answer whatever questions we can related to the voiceover business. This will not be an infomercial for the class. It is possible that someone will ask a question that we really cannot answer in this teleseminar. You know, somebody says, okay, tell me how to create a business plan for my voiceover business. You know, well, that's actually, we spend a week on that. So if there are times when one of us says, well, you know, we, we actually talk about that a lot in detail in the class. We're not trying to duck the question or do a bait and switch. Uh, we, we will do our best to give some valuable answer to everything. And I hope you will understand if there is something that simply would require too in-depth an answer for this particular conversation. And if anyone wants to tweet your question in real time, please uh, uh, tweet to at voiceoverbiz. I see someone just followed us. They're probably listening to us right now. I see that Sappy just followed us. So it's at voiceoverbiz. And uh, Harlan, I think uh, given all the disclaimers, you want to jump into this thing and I'll throw, throw the first question at you? I, that sounds good to me. Okay. Cam asks, is it the character of the artist, the tone of the voice, or the adaptability or the adaptability of the person that ultimately lands you the voiceover job. Well, it's, it's well, it's well put. Um, although what it what it does is to back me into a corner, and I hate to say this, but it really isn't any of those things. Although all of those things are important, when you say landing the job, uh, that sort of employ. I'm, I'm going I'm to take a leap here. That 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 um, what Cam was going after was they had auditioned for something, either on a pay-for-play or through an agent, whatever, did their audition, and how did they make the selection? Um, and the element that's left out of that, of course, is if you're relying on all, only those places to bring you the possibility of work, that, that's a big mistake, and that is something we spend a lot of time on, and that's, that's building a business as opposed to hoping you'll win an audition. But taking it very specifically, if it's the audition, um, and when, when the other question is the character of the artist, does that mean the reputation of the artist, or are we talking about character voices? Oh, that, I'm going to take it. Point. Let's let, let's make it both because I had assumed they meant the character, you know, the, the the character implied by the voice. But let's add the reputation of the character of the person. Let's add okay, good. both. Okay, so one one of those because you know it, it, it is so interesting. I used to boss many years ago when I was in advertising, and he's always drilling us, always, 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 as I always talk about the work of voiceover work, he always said, meanings are in people, not in words. And, and character voice to us, the word character as voiceover people can mean something entirely different, as I just brought up, or the character is a reputation of the person. If we can combine all of those, in my opinion, it is rarely about the tone of the voice. It is rarely about uh, how you showed your ability to be directed far, far more important than that is the reputation and the character of the person. You know, let's face it, when we audition, there's a lot of people who can do that job. And in your short chance, one or two hits on this thing, you, you know, you're, you can be reaching for the brass ring and hoping that you win a lottery ticket. If you have established yourself with a reputation and character, even if they don't know you specifically, but they know of your work, they know of your name, they've heard that you're a great person to work with, that can go a tremendous way toward you, quote, winning that audition. It seems to me that there is a perception that the best audition wins, that people, the deciders, listen to everything, and they somehow grade them, and the one that is the absolute best is the one that gets the job. And my experience suggests that it's the first one that makes the employer feel safe, feel like, yeah. you know what, yeah. if we hire this person, we're going to get our what problem. we want, right. and we won't regret it. Exactly right. Exactly right. When I did some casting a few years ago, that was the, the, the A number one question among the few, three or four top guys for it. And in that case, the one that everybody loved, I just happened to call the agent because I knew the agent well. And I said, tell me about Clinton. And he
And she said simply this, and, and, this, and this is where agents are still important. She said, he's the real deal, Harlan. <laughs> done, done. And she didn't mean he's the real deal because he can read the script in time. She meant he's a real professional, which he was. He was a great gentleman who actually became a friend of mine. Yeah, you want someone who solves a problem. And the, the sad fact is if you are doing group, pardon the negative term, group group auditioning, you know, not something that specifically you were sent on, they requested you, there's 10 other people there, that's quite different. But you're going on a cattle call or you're doing a, a cyber cattle call. Um, they listen, and when they hear the person that sounds right, and it's great if they say, oh, okay, look at these three people, they all could be good. You know, this guy, Dan O'Day, I've heard about him. He's good. My friend George uses him on blah, blah, blah all the time. Let's go with him. It's not a solve a problem. People want to work with people they want to work, like to work with. It may not be that Dan O'Day did the best audition. What the hell does the best mean anyway? But you presented yourself and your work in a, in a professional way. You certainly could do the job. And then it, then it is the character of the person. And, and is this someone who can solve our problem, won't be a bother, won't be trouble, and we can move on. Do they listen to all the auditions? Of course they don't. Well, Sometimes it's the first couple of people, and they go, you know what? Either one of these two women would be fabulous. Well, we've got 50 other people to listen to. Yeah, and we have lives. So let's just choose one of them and move on. Well, and without our knowing this was going to happen, I, I think you've introduced an element that might even become the theme of this call because in looking over the questions, I realized that, that I'm going to have to talk about something, and that is solving problems. And if you are trying to build your business on the pay-to-play sites where it's a meat market and the problem that the employer is trying to solve is to get somebody to do this job cheap, that they might hire you if you'll do the job cheap and meet their other requirements, but can you build a sustainable business solving those people's problems? You know, I think a lot of people are solving the problems of the wrong people because if, if their problem is who will do this for 50 bucks, I'm not sure it's in your best interest to spend your time going after it. You're right. You're right. So let's see here. Uh, Kenneth was the first person to tweet a question to us. Mm -hmm. And Kenneth says, how do you target decision makers who hire voice actors? I'm tired of pay-to-play and no-pay freelance sites. Yeah, that's good. And that's tough, and, that, and that there's, there's a number of elements to that, but why don't you take that one and just – because for those of you listening in, basically, you know, I've made my living for 35 years doing voiceover work, and, and I am 100% convinced it was not necessarily the great talent. It was that I approached it as a business from the get-go and have always treated it as my voiceover business. And I met Dan, who is a wonderful marketer, uh, and uh, much as we kid each other, I mean, I admire him tremendously. Um, I hope this isn't being recorded, is it? Um, because, as a friend, but also because he has this sharp marketing, laser-like look at things. I'll wander out and talk about all kinds of esoteric voice crap, and Dan will say, why don't you pick up the phone and say the following? So why don't you take that one? Okay, well, well thank you. Too. Um, I just want to have the rec record of this. That's actually the first time Harlan's ever said anything nice to or about me. So uh, thank I, I appreciate that, Harlan, and I, I only wish I could reciprocate. <laughs> Uh, so everyone has forgotten <laughs> Kenneth's question, which was, how do you target decision makers who hire voice actors? I'm tired of pay-to-play and no pay freelance sites. Um, okay. Kenneth, first, we, we applaud your desire to stop competing with the entire world for mostly low-paying jobs. And, in fact, the entire third week of this year's class is devoted to that. But before you can target the decision makers, first you have to ask yourself, what do I do best? That is, where am I most competitive compared to the rest of the voiceover world? That's where you start. Once you've determined that, then you have to ask, of the things I do best, let's say there's more than one thing that you do well, which do I enjoy the most? And now that you've determined the thing, or maybe the things that you do the best and that you enjoy the most, now sit down with a piece of paper and a writing utensil and turn off your computer and your telephone and your TV and Concentrate all of your mental energies on answering the following two questions. What problem do I solve and for whom? What's holding you back is you're trying to reach, in your words, decision makers who hire voice actors. That means you've got the problem. How do I get hired to do voiceovers? And you're looking for someone to solve it for you. But here's the deal. Nobody has the job of solving your problem. Well, I guess that would 
be excluding a class like ours. You know, we've made that our job, but everybody else has problems of their own, and what they need is someone who's willing and able to solve those problems. So instead of trying to reach decision makers who hire voice actors, you need to map out both a business plan and a marketing plan for reaching decision makers whose problems you can help solve. And that's it's something we will hit you with again and again and again. You're not in the job of getting hired. You're in the profession of helping people solve problems. In your life, when you have had a problem that you could not solve, you asked people, who do you know who can solve this for me? And you didn't say for free or for cheapest. Just who do you know who can make this problem go away, who can take care of it and do a great job, and I'll be I'll be able to go do the things that I do well. We've all been in that situation, and that's the position that you want to place yourself in as the person who can solve the problem that that particular business owner is having. Harlan, does that make sense, or did I yeah, absolutely? Did I, we I was just thinking about <clears throat> major plumbing problem. I told you the plumbing problems we had. Oh yeah, day. and it, it, you know to take it's best to talk outside voiceover, really. You know, it's like we get all hung up on it, and it's so special, it's so different. No, it isn't. It really isn't. It's solving problems for people. It's a business. Um, but our search under duress to find the right plumbing company to solve it was a real serious problem we had here at the house. And when I got back home here and Mike was here and I spoke with Mike and he was intelligent and respectful and said, let me show you the, you know, the video of this problem in, in the house, blah, 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 blah. All of a sudden, I thought this is the guy who can solve. I wasn't didn't really ask him how much it was going to be. Are you going to be cheaper? I did. I did not go shopping around after the fact, and it's not cheap. It needs to be done. But he explained it in such a careful way, and was very professional, and also pointed out a couple of other things that that you know they could take care of that needed to be done. And I felt comfortable. I felt that this is the guy that can solve my problem. He's not selling me something. He's saying, here's what needs to be done to do it right, Harlan. You could do it this way. You'll have the same problem five years from now. We do it right now. It's that. Is what you're saying, Dan. I mean, that's that's who you want to do business with, and that's a big part of what, where we fall apart as actors. A lot is we do a job and then we don't ever follow through with that, make that client our client, our customer. Uh, but when we do that, you have somebody that you know it's not the career, that's the one job. It's a client. Right. It goes on, and assuming Mike and his team do a good job here, they probably will be our plumbers for as long as we live here. And if he does do a good, it turns out that he did do a good job. How will you react if next week you tell a friend that you hired that guy and your friend says, oh, I know a guy who would have done it much cheaper. Are, are you going to feel bad and have no. <laughs> you know, Obviously. No. I don't, I don't want someone cheaper. I want it done right. And I think that's most people. You want the yeah. job done right. Yeah. And, and you, you, know, you can't help but, but talk about it and, and say, you know, the most amazing thing happened. I, I bought a car accessory a while back. And the most amazing thing that happened was that I got a call, not from a salesman. I bought, you know, bought this at a dealer, and I got a call, and I don't know the area code. And he said, "Hi, Mr. Hogan. So I'm a technician with K40, and I see that you bought one of our units, and want to thank you. You know, we're a small company, but I really appreciate you buying that. Here's my direct number. If you have any questions, suggestions, give me a call anytime. Bye bye." I thought, "Who does that? I can't tell you how many people I've told that to." Why doesn't everybody do that? Yeah, exactly. And we weren't on the phone more than 30 seconds. If you can do that with your voiceover business, you can sustain the, the, the inevitable downs. I mean, the ups are easy, but there are going to be times when it's tough, and you've built enough reputation and people who hire you that you work for and you stay in touch with, you can have a long-term career. Even though your voice will change, you'll age, your interest may change, your, your, your physical presence may change. If I move someplace, you can sustain that business. And, it really isn't that complicated, but we just don't think of it that way. We look at it as, well, through the, I think you must have said this one time, Dan, or somebody did, like, we have a career built on the, on the kindness of strangers. We hope, we hope that, you know, oh, the agent yeah. will call us, or we hope someone will, if they just call me today, yeah, yeah. get over it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it doesn't it's, happen. It's, it's what a friend of mine calls hope marketing. Yeah. That's and, good. And I, I appropriated that a few years ago because I, I thought it was so clever. And I would have thought of it. If, if oh, absolutely, because you're brilliant. Time. Anyway. So uh, uh, I'm Dan O'Day, and the other person is Harlan Hogan, and we're you know, kind of promoting our annual how to, uh, you're, you're starting your voiceover business class, which we do once a year. I, there's no guarantee we'll do it again, but so far we've done it once a year, and we're, it will be – the rest of the month of October, basically, starting next week, and we're closing registration in a few days. 
And if anyone's interested, it's the voiceoverclass.com. Okay, let's let's change gears. Let's go to a technical prognostication question. Ah, Christine, prognostication. <laughs> yeah. Christine says, if new ISDN installs are going away, will future remote sessions go completely digital? For example, Source Connect. So what, <clears throat> you going to take that, I assume? Or? Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. And, and this is something, you know, we get a lot of questions about, is ISDN still necessary or helpful or whatever? But this is this is a very specific question that I don't think we've been asked, which is the, the, the question implies that fewer and fewer ISDN installations are occurring. It certainly is becoming more and more difficult to find somebody at the local phone company who knows what you're talking about. So this person believes that it's it's uh, new installations of ISDN lines are decreasing dramatically and are going to disappear. Therefore, does that mean that in the future all remote sessions will become digital? Well, first of all, I get in trouble when you try to prognosticate. Uh, I can just say personally, uh, I wrote a book uh, in 2000, so that's 13 years old or 12 years old, and in that I talked about ISDN, and at that point kind of predicted, I figured within five years everything would be on the Internet, that ISDN would be dead. Well, here we are 13 years later, and it's far from dead. For those of you who don't know what in God's name Harlan and Dan and uh, Christine are talking about. ISDN means Integrated Services Data Network, which means nothing to you, I know. What it basically, and, and this is very non-technical, and people can you know, take exception to my terminology, what it basically means is that you have one or more, usually two, digital phone lines that you have installed in your studio. If you have a studio outside your home, most of us have studios in our homes. and you also then have a box which is called a codec, coder, decoder, which works in many ways like a modem. Techies will go, Harlan, it's not a modem. I don't care. It basically converts MP3 on the fly. It basically takes your voice, sends it down the phone line in air quality so it can go right on the air, and you hear the producer from the other end clear as a bell. It's just like standing in a professional studio with a piece of glass between you looking at the person in terms of audio quality. That's valuable because the tracks are available immediately. And for some, some parts of the world, some parts of the business, that's critical. If you're doing station announcements tonight on WTMJ, a tragedy in Kenosha, that's going to be recorded maybe 10 minutes before the news program even goes on the air. So they need to have those tracks now. They don't even have time to download or MP3 or certainly don't have time to send CDs out. It's now. Um, I do a lot of political work, and it's very similar there because they quite often call at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning and say, we've got to redo the thing we did at 6. It's got to go on by 6 o'clock in the morning, and you do it. And it's, the audio tracks go on immediately. ISDN is the gold standard. It's the best. From a talent standpoint, it's great because you are not responsible for any of the audio tracks or recording them or doing anything. It's like a good old-fashioned session. You have somebody at the other end, an engineer, hey, Harlan, give me a level. Okay, you read it. Give us another one quicker, two more. Trips on the end. Thank you. Bye-bye. Go to bed. Click. We love it. Now, because of DSL and all and, and you know, cable modems and everything where we've got increased bandwidth, there are ISDN replacements and almost equivalents, such as Source Connect, that are out there. They're much less expensive. You don't have to. When you have those phone lines come in, you're paying for two phone lines a month, if you can get it, and a piece of gear that can run several thousand dollars. But... But the big but is the infrastructure of that in Europe in particular is huge. In America, it's huge. The broadcasters still use this. They use it all the time when they cover games because they need air quality, and they've got booth announcer and a color guy out covering a, a basketball game or a football game or whatever, and they need air quality. It can't sound like you're on the telephone. The downside of the Internet still, despite better bandwidth, is the way data information is sent. It's sent in little packets, and then they can be, on the other end, they're reassembled. Anybody who's used Skype, you can put up your hand probably, and Skype can be great, and I use it for, uh, for phone patches, for patches like this, connections like this often. Every so often, you will get, and then I said to Dan, he, well, it will break up the communication. It's still a problem. They've gotten much better with the Internet solutions, but as of this moment, there are certain places where ISDN is, is true. It's, it's hard to get it installed now. People who have it are grandfathered in. It really is situational based on the kind of work you're doing. For most talent, the Internet connections will work fine. A plain old telephone 
system, POTS line, plain old telephone, which is what Dan and I are doing. We just on the telephone. We, we, we do that. We could do a webinar, and we could make this complicated, but we don't, we don't want it to be about technology. We want it to be about communication. And the simplest thing is a landline telephone. I think what will happen is the Internet will at some point either stop that protocol with, with, with sending packets. It certainly is getting much faster. And probably at some point all our telephone calls will be, if you want to say Internet or digital, at air quality. We, we won't even think about it. Of course, a telephone call, we don't even call them telephones maybe, will be air quality. I mean, it's going to be the bandwidth is there. But it's not there yet. Let's add some advice. I don't think we've ever talked about this. So this is, this is both unexpected and I believe the first time we've ever discussed it. If, if, if you want to have a voiceover business, you know, obviously, it's not about the technology. The technology no, no, is no. what makes it possible to do your job, but it is not your job. So if you're going to have a voiceover business and you're going to take it seriously, and let's say, for example, you have two different ways to complete a job, two different uh, choices of technology, and if you do one of them, you, you'll be, you're thinking, well, I could just do it this way. That'll be good enough. If it's not as good as the other way that you also have at your disposal, you're shortchanging your career. And Harlan, Harlan, you and I had this today. You know, we tested this bridge line earlier today, and I called in using a different kind of phone line, which would cost me zero to call. And I had tested it myself just privately, and it sounded great. And I was really excited. And Harlan and I, you know, talked for about 15, 20 minutes on the phone, and everything was fine. And then I said, oh, by the way, you know, I'm calling on this new way. How does it sound? They said, well, it you know, sounds pretty good. Uh, your voice is a little, maybe a little low, but it sounds pretty good. And so I said, well, okay, let me hang up and call you from my other line, the, the, the more traditional, more expensive one. And I called in, and Harlan said, oh, yeah, yeah, th this, this is better. You know, the other, one, the other one wasn't bad, you know, but this is better. And that was not the answer I wanted to hear, Harlan. You know, I wanted to hear... <laughs> yeah. That the free, the calling for free was just as good as the calling for two and a half cents a minute, which is my long distance plan. But you, you, it, when you have a choice, you don't deliver good enough to your clients. You deliver the best that you can. Now, if if all you have is one option, then then great, you do that. But when you've got the choice, don't go for the one that's the cheapest or that everyone says is the most desirable. Go for the one good that enough. works the best. Yeah, it's good enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you know, for, for, for our business, I mean, there, there, there are plenty of times when you do have to say it's good enough. But in terms of something that, that measurably affects what your client will receive, there's really no such thing as, oh, it's good enough. Okay, let's change directions okay. and take a question from Rob. And I guess Rob is referring, I think he's referring to something we said in our last Q&A teleseminar. It might have been something, that, Harlan, that you said in that video you made, the seven steps to a voiceover business. Yeah, I'd but have to go back and look again. But it's either but, that so what, or... What, what, what is, what's this question about? He says, I understand the part about scouting local. And this is where, you know, we talk, we, we're, we're you and... I, I know in the video you said there's more business, voiceover business to be had down the street than right, there's right. online, something like that. Yes. And so whether it came from the video or from one of our other seminars, that's what he's talking about, about finding that you, there is, if you're a voice actor, voiceover artist, voice professional, and you've achieved a certain level of quality and uh, of your work and professionalism in your business, there is more work in your neighborhood, in your town, than you can handle. And we really encourage people to go get that work and not compete for the lower paying, crappier jobs online. And so um, that's what we're talking about. And going back to Rob, Rob says, my question is what do you say when you approach them? We have a voiceover business, may not work because some people might not know what that is. I, I think that goes back really to my earlier response. I, I think it was Kenneth's question. You know, he, even if they know what a voiceover business is, that's not what you should be talking about with prospects. When your approach is we have a voiceover business, then your message becomes would you hire us? In fact, right. Harlan, I, I wrote down what you said. Um, Meanings are in people, not in words. Right. So when you say, we have a voiceover business, those are the words, but the meaning that the other person gets from that is, would you please hire us? Yeah. But no. when, you're, when your genuine, <laughs> honest approach is, 
I solve this problem for businesses right. like yours. Right. Then your message becomes, would you like me to solve that problem for you? Right. And again, to get to that point, first you need to figure out what problems are causing your prospects pain and that you can truly make go away for them. That's the position that you want to achieve. When Harlan had the plumbing emergency in his house yesterday, he wanted to find the person mm -hmm. who could solve it, not the person who would solve it the cheapest or was the friendliest or the most convenient, it was the person who could solve it. Right. And, that, that's and, 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 and just a sidebar, while uh, Leslie was here panicking and I was off doing whatever I was doing trying to get home, you know, the first thing she did was to call a couple of neighbors. First thing she did, just like ask, business people do, we have a problem. We've got some serious plumbing problem. And, you know, a couple of people said, oh, Lake Cook Plumbing, <laughs> done, done. If two neighbors say to you, these are the people, <laughs> what, am I going to go to the Yellow Pages? It's the yeah, same she, in our she, business. She didn't go to Yelp. No, she didn't go to Yelp. She didn't go look for reviews. When you want something solved, you want it now. And, and that's where that character comes in, where that reputation comes in. That's where that agent said to me, he's the real deal. I mean, so, that's what we're after. Rob, if, if we were to um, kind of take the approach that you suggested, and I'm certainly not mocking your question because, you know, you're right no, no, that no. saying it's I have a question. voiceover business, you know, people are this, a lot of people are going to go, well, what's that? But to, to go back to that whole model, um, with this class that Harlan and I teach, you know, we didn't put up a page saying, hey, we've got this great class, and we really think, you know, you should take it, and, and here's why. Here, uh, I just pulled up the registration page, which uh, conveniently I can uh, – how's this for smooth? At the voiceoverclass.com. See, nobody realized I just put in a plug for the website. Uh, but I just pulled up the uh, – well, it wasn't the goal. It wasn't the goal, but, you know. So, I, I, so I'm looking, I'm looking um, at the website at where people register, and underneath the, the video of Harlan, it says the following. You have the talent. You have the desire. So why haven't you succeeded in creating a voiceover career that rewards you handsomely for doing what you love? Okay, that's the problem that we do our level best to solve. That's very different from, you know, what do you do? Oh, we teach a voiceover class. You know, well, that's nice. You know, yeah. Well, no, we, so does everybody we help, else. <laughs> yeah, we help these people with this problem and this desire. We help them achieve it. And the way we do it is, is with a class. So... I don't know how Rob feels about that answer, um, but you've got to start by defining that problem that you do solve for somebody. Yeah, and versus, hi, I have intergalactic voiceover. Okay, well, we're really busy right now. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah, thank exactly. you. Hi, we're a local plumber. We do great work. Mm, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, no, I actually don't... Uh, I know, I know little about this, uh, but I see a tweet from Scott Chambers. Mm -hmm. And Scott, so Harlan, this is for you. Okay. Uh, my demos are available for download on my site, but they're hosted on SoundCloud. Is that acceptable? I don't know either. I, um, I've heard SoundCloud, I believe it basically is the audio equivalent of YouTube. Um, my only caveat on any of that stuff is you, you just want to make sure if, if you're using that as a hosting site, and you can link to it and you can rely on it. We certainly use YouTube for a lot of our video stuff because, you know, it takes such huge room. But my only caveat is make sure that's not the only place. Their, their site can go down. Their site can get hacked. They could decide one day, and they probably will, hey, you've got 14 videos up here. Now we're going to charge you blank per month, which is not out of line, really. I, I'm always nervous about that. So I'm just say from in my experience, anything audio, anything video that, that we have, like on my site or we have on the store site, we actually have it, and you know, on a couple of hard drives. So if something goes belly up, you've you've got it. And Scott, you know, I got to tell you, when I saw your tweet, because uh, you know, I certainly have heard of SoundCloud, and you know, it's somebody somebody had posted something or sent me an email. Some I don't know. Some, I, don't know I think it was an email actually, but obviously it wasn't a friend of mine saying, hey. Idiot, why don't you just put your stuff up on SoundCloud? And so I be, it became aware, okay, there are some people who think that apparently whatever it is I'm doing is not uh, modern enough. And so I've heard about you know, hosting files on SoundCloud. I've never been there. I just uh, uh, And so some people are listening right now thinking, wow, it's damn behind the times. But let me give you a quick analysis of what I'm seeing. From what I'm seeing, I would not have my demos hosted on SoundCloud if I am correct in believing that 
the person who is listening to your demo can see that it is on SoundCloud. For example, if you have your video hosted on YouTube, there are times, you know, Harley mentioned we use YouTube at times for our videos. There are times that we don't. Um, you know, there, there are times where we, we we want the entire world to be able to see our video. That's great. Anybody wants to see it can see it. There are other times we only want certain people to see right. it. Um, you know, we, we, we are our private site. Uh, if we have videos on, on our private I mean, member site, for example, well, that, that's not going to be on YouTube because even if we make it unlisted on YouTube, that still could be shared. If, uh, unlisted means if you know the direct URL to the video, you can see it. Now, none of our students would share it with anybody anyway, but just for safety, something like that, there are other private ways to host videos. One is you host it directly on your site. Uh, another is to use uh, a page, well, there's a pay and a free version uh, but a service called Vimeo. And at least with the paid one, you can make it so no one can embed it or um, edit it or, or make, whatever. Yeah, you yeah. can make it not visible to the community. So I'm looking at SoundCloud and my initial instinct tells me that this is very similar in many ways to YouTube. That mm -hmm. people yeah, can I see think. you're using an outside source, which right away um, it's what, why are you a professional or do you have a studio? And it's, you might be doing your entire business out of the spare bedroom or the spare bathroom for that matter, you know, or the garage or whatever, but it's not supposed to appear that way to the outside world. The outside world, they want to have total confidence in your ability to deliver a great quality product, you know, the state of the art. And if they see that you're doing a shortcut, something that, probably is free or is you know, a, a minimal thing that's hosted elsewhere, you lose credibility there. And also, you do, you know, I'm, I, I did a search for uh, voiceover, and I got a bunch of voiceover um, files and uh, along with suggestions. So yeah. again, the, the, thank you. Well, right. it's, like, it's, like, it's like, Harlan, let's pretend that there were another voiceover business class in the world. Of course there's not, so don't anybody bother looking, okay? But let's pretend there were. If on our registration page, there was something on the side that said, check out these other competing voiceover <laughs> classes. Well, yeah, that's the Amazon approach, but that isn't necessarily good for you. <laughs> yes, yeah, the, 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 that's the thing. Amazon wants to sell books. They don't care if it's your book or somebody else's. YouTube wants people to watch videos, and they don't care if it's yours or somebody else's. Exactly, exactly. And exactly. my first uh, glance here suggests to me that that applies to SoundCloud, which in no way right. is a critique of them. Uh, right. But there, it, it really... It, it's really not difficult to host your, you know, especially for audio. Yeah, um, audio is so simple. And you know, no matter how many audio files you have, it's just not going to take up much bandwidth. Right. And and then you, you own, you know, you own your own little world, your own little domain, and yeah. you keep keep them there. And, and that and that is Har Harlan gave a, a more generally applicable, really important tip, which is always have anything digital. You better have it in three different places. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, oh you know, yes. You know, a, fr a friend of mine, uh, uh, Jeffrey Hazlett, was um, become this big shot best-selling business author. He's got his own TV show now and everything. But uh, he was uh, chief marketing officer for Eastman Kodak, and I remember him saying, "You know what? When um, you you lose all your photos, you haven't backed them up anywhere. You lose them all, and you download the thumbnails that you uploaded to Facebook." You're not going to be happy. <laughs> you know, that, no, you're that's, not. That's not a backup. That's and not a backup, no. An, another friend of ours, Steve Cunningham, who is world-class at audio uh, engineering, processing, recording, everything, uh, Steve is fond of saying, if it's digital, if it doesn't exist in three places, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Bella says... I'm a novice. I have no idea where to start, but I'm excited about the opportunity of a new career path. I have community theater experience, and I'm a vocalist. I'm hoping that will lend some practical support, but in terms of starting an actual business, I have no idea where to begin. I've listened to a couple of guru presentations in the past, but the information was so broad, I left there scrambled. I love Bella. She wrote, that's, a, that's, a, that's such a great question, and it, and it really is. Do you remember when we first, the first couple of years we did this, we decided to do it because um, I, I've never done the coaching particularly or wanted to, and certainly not on presentation or performance, but the business aspect you know, has always interested me. And, and there was a guru who kept wherever my name appeared. Do you remember this, Dan? Would, would, I remember it very well. Yeah. Whenever there was a Harlan Hogan mention of any kind, not, not just 
the store or, or you know, I mean, anything about performance or, or voiceover, there would be a thing, a Google ad alongside, want a real voice guru? Call so-and-so. And so Guru get, became a funny word for us, along with turnkey solutions. So <laughs> yes. Here's the one, one, one technique fits all. Uh, and we should talk before we're done, and, you know, we make this too long, but we do, do, Dan, don't forget, to, and I'll let you do that, to talk about accountability and action. Oh, okay. Because it's one thing for somebody to stand up, anybody, including me, including Dan, if you're a good speaker, and throw out a lot of good ideas, and people walk out and go, that's great, that's terrific. But if you're not using that information, as, as she's kind of saying, hey, we heard this guru thing, but it was so vague, and, and, they, and they probably said, you know, remember, voiceover is a business. Well, that's no help. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's no yeah, help at all. What do you need? It. Yes, be sure to be, you know, it's like, no, no, we need specific steps to take, and that's what, what we tried to do. Your community theater experience is fabulous. Your vocalist, exp- vocalist experience is fabulous from a performance standpoint. And, and Bellis, it's a really good question because she's being really honest that, you know, I, I, I think I've got some skills, and she obviously doesn't. And, and theater background is wonderful. Musical background is great in terms of performance, uh, which is honestly the simplest part of this job, the easiest part. The hard part is what we're talking about, but I don't know where to begin building a business. So that's a good, honest thing, um, and, and a simple. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a, you know, be sure be sure to send a postcard out uh, with your name on it and all the things you just appeared on. Or today, be sure to send out a newsletter that says, "Hey, I've really been busy. Here's what I've been doing." Oh yeah, that'll work. That's kind of what you get from the gurus. And you know, the thing is, Danny and and, and Bella and everybody else. What basically happens, to, to, I'm going to say this without being negative or critical of anyone, this is just human nature, and certainly I did it starting out, and we all do it, but you look around, and you say, I don't want to do voiceover, so you look and you see, well, what is everybody else doing? Oh, they're, 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 they're making contacts to get an agent. Maybe they live in New York, Chicago, or L.A., or places where there are agents, and they do everything in their power. And there's nothing wrong with getting an agent. That's fine. But, but that's what everybody else does, so I'll do that. Oh, they've all joined Voices123 or Voice.com or Commercial Voices. Nothing wrong with that. It's good auditioning experience. But they just end up doing what everybody else does. So when they imitate that, at best they end up struggling to earn you know, enough from voiceovers to make it hopefully more than a hobby so you can actually write off some of the expenses, which... Again, we talk about where the IRS rules are on that because the IRS doesn't like to have you take deductions for a hobby. One must make some money at this. So the biggest, quickest answer to Bella is you start. Here's how you start. By recognizing, understanding, you need right from the get-go to build a genuine, sustainable voice-over business, not a cookie cutter of what everybody else did or what some guru told you to do, and you're smart to know that that's not going to do it. That means like it or not, doing some things that most voiceover actors don't want to. I like the Chicago thing. I don't want to. It don't work. Well, no, you know, pick up the phone and call this particular Well, I don't want to do that. I just want to have somebody else do that for me. Well, then you have a don't want to career because the other person can't, can't do it as well as you can and won't do it as well. Even your agent, you know, who may love you and think you're really talented, has a whole lot of other people she or he can sell. So, we could spend all night on this one, but the, the key here is, and it's important and really valuable in many ways to, to, if you can right from the get-go say, I'm actually going to have a business, which involves accounting, which involves lots of marketing, which involves all of the aspects, getting the equipment together, getting your skill set together, but not necessarily flailing about doing what every, everyone else does. When you do what they don't do, you have a huge competitive advantage. Harlan, I just wrote that down, uh, a don't want a career. That's great. You I, like I haven't heard that. Well, you know, the, the variation of the don't want to is a friend of mine, a very talented guy, and, and, and had a pretty good career. I think it could have been much better. But he would say, I shouldn't have to do that. Uh, you know, I know I really ought to do a promotion. I really ought to do but I shouldn't have to do that. And I would just sit there because I liked him, and he was a friend of mine, and it certainly wasn't my job. And I'm thinking, I don't want to do those things either. But I, I never thought I shouldn't have to. I'm trying to, you know, raise a couple of kids, send them through college, have a good life, uh, which I have been blessed to do. I'm like, what do you mean? You do? It's those don't want to things that, in addition to whatever the, whatever the financial reward is, it's those don't want to things that enable you to do what you want to do, which right. is talk into a microphone. Right. I mean, that's fun. That's the fun part. And the don't want to stuff is the work that you exactly. do so you, you can have fun. You know, I make – my entire life uh, I've spent at least 50% of my professional life has, has always been as a writer. And, and I know, Harlan, you've written a few books, but we've never talked about the writing process, so I don't know how you feel about that. But for me and for many writers – I, I can tell you the the best feeling in the world and the worst feeling in the world. 
And the best feeling in the world for a writer is having written. And the worst feeling is having to write. Yes, absolutely agree 100%. <laughs> and some, somebody, once, somebody once said, being a writer would be great if it weren't for the paperwork. <laughs> and, and that's the same thing for the people who want to be, be voice actors. But, yeah, but they don't want to market. And, you know, and, well, no, okay, yeah. I, yeah, I'll, I'll do marketing by signing up for some service that will automatically send out. Okay, that's not doing it. You know, you, if, you, if you want to have the fun of what you want to do, then there's work involved. Bella had talked about the information not being practical and it being too broad in previous things she's encountered. If you ask our previous students, or, you know, or for that matter, if you look at the course description at thevoiceoverclass.com, I'm pretty sure you'll see that we cover very specific aspects of the voiceover business in great detail. Our goal isn't to give you a broad overview and then send you on your way. And that's why we spend four entire weeks on this class. It's, you know, it's teaching, it's answering questions, we give assignments, we hold students accountable. So yeah, to direct your point, this class is very practical and a lot of the stuff we teach you just won't learn anywhere else. But having said that, once again, I have to make sure you understand that while Harlan will spend four weeks mentoring you and I'll be spending four weeks coaching you on a lot of the marketing and it's going to be up to you to take action. We do everything we can to motivate you, to push you, to hold you accountable. We bring you into our private member site where you can get help from or you can compare notes with others. We give you specific assignments with deadlines attached, but we can't do it for you. We would rather someone not take this if they're not going to put the time in because then we're going to fail in a sense because you're not going to get anywhere near as much out of it if you don't do the assignments. We want our students to be people who are willing to do the work. Otherwise, you know, then, then otherwise we are just, you know, we're just selling it to anyone and, and well, yeah. whatever they get out of it, who cares? And that's, that's not what we're doing here. And the assignments aren't terribly time consuming and the, they are not difficult. That, that's the no, other thing no. is it's that just, it's looking at the blank paper. Like you just it's said, just, it's, it's, yeah, it's, exactly. doing it's actually pretty easy. It's just getting around to it. You know, it's yeah. human nature. Most people who dream of having a voiceover business or who maybe do it on the side, but really wish they could do it full time. I believe they're held back by fear. There's stuff that they haven't learned yet, and they're secretly afraid they won't be able to do it. Yeah. And that's totally natural. That's the way the human mind works. And when I feel that way, if necessary, I will ask myself, okay, look at the other millions of people who have learned how to do this new thing that you're trying to learn. Do you really think that you're that much dumber than they are? And I don't think I'm dumber than most people. So you know, asking myself that question motivates me to move forward even when it might seem a little scary. So you know, Bella, when, when, when we talk about the assignments, the question is not will you be able to do them or will you have time to do them? The question is will you do them? Right. Because they're not difficult, they're not terribly time consuming, but we can't come to your house and force you to do them. Harlan, this is a question from Marianne. And, and I know, I'm actually I know that I think this is the first week we go into this in tremendous detail. So if you can just give kind of a uh, quick, helpful answer. She says, I am a tech idiot slash technophobe, but even I realize that I must begin to learn how. Could you give me a basic startup plan that's in the reasonable price range? So Harlan, what I'm suggesting is, you know, I wouldn't, just for sake of time, I wouldn't get into naming the best, you know, comparing brands and stuff. Hey, Marianne, join the voiceover club. I mean, what has happened to the business? Uh, and which I'm very much aware of because I'm, I have just finished, <laughs> this is what Dan was talking about, finished writing the second edition of VO. And in that one, in 2001, I talked about a studio of your own and the possibility that we, we might soon be recording gasp auditions at home. And, and, and people laughed at me. And, and maybe someday even finish tracks. Oh, come on, that's not going to happen. Well, within less than 10 years, it did. Revolutionize the business. She's right. This is a whole new skill set. It is not that hard. And, and we do spend a lot of time about not becoming a recording engineer. It's not really your job. But you do need to be able to at least audition from home with good quality. Originally, right off the bat, people said, um, no, you can audition this at home, and you can just do it on a cheap, you know, little USB cheapy microphone, or just talk into your iPhone or whatever, because people will realize the actual session won't be there. You'll be going to a studio. Well, now people have realized we can hire these people, and they have studios that sound professional. That saves us a lot of time, and it saves us a lot of money. So if your auditions aren't of pretty good quality, 
that can account for losing a gig, particularly as we talked about when there's so many people auditioning. And Dan knows this is one of the things I, I've talked about a lot. Most casting is not choosing, it's eliminating. There are 10 people there, and you see these are the 10 people there. I mean, they're all terrific. I don't know how to choose. Hmm. Well, you know, John's audio sounded really terrible. It's all garbled and cruddy. And I mean, you know, it took John's out. Oh, but Harlan, wouldn't they call John and say, is there a studio you could go to? No. It's less about choosing than eliminating people. So you want your auditions and, of course, final recordings to be professional. The good news is it doesn't cost a hell of a lot of money. And the, 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 the skill set is not that hard. If you can do word processing, you can do audio recording. So... Basically, you need a good microphone. The, the, the cheap USB guys are generally junk, and you sound like you're talking in a tube. But you don't need to spend $1,000 or $2,000 on, on a high-end mic. Today, you can find good quality studio cardio condenser microphones for around 300 bucks. You need a recording space of some kind. Um, that can be a number. It could just be a room with some quilts in it, or it could be a room with some acoustical foam, or a portable solution, or whatever. You need a stand for your microphone, a pop filter. The pop filter keeps you from p -p 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 popping your peas, which is something you should be able to do without the pop filter, but occasionally that happens. But more importantly, it keeps moisture. We used to call them spit filters, but right, it's important the because filter. the thing that will destroy a microphone faster than anything else is moisture. So a little pop filter, a set of what in the business is called cans, which are headphones, and a converter. No matter what computer you have, you need an analog to digital converter. There is one in your laptop, and even if it's a MacBook Air or a MacBook Pro or an iMac, those are mainly, they're like 15 cents. They're designed to do games and hear stuff off the Internet and will not get you air quality, so you need this device. When I, my first A to D converter was $5,000. Today you can get a good analog to digital converter for about 200 bucks, and, and, and that's been part of the revolution is this ability to have in, relatively inexpensive gear. So I would say on a very basic level, not with, um, I'm eliminating the computer because most of us have a computer. I would say 99.99% .99 of the time, the computer that you currently own will handle recording software fine. You record in mono, not stereo, because we only have one mouth. It's simple. It's audio. Video is a whole other world, but audio does not take that much room, and the programs don't require a lot of resources. If you're in a studio and you see all those big monitors and all this stuff, well, they're mixing music and they're bringing elements in, and we don't do that. I mean, you can do that if you want to get another sidebar, but for most of us, we're recording a simple 10-second, 15-second, 60-second piece of copy, saving it, sending it off. So the computer you have now should be fine, and on a very bare bones, you can actually pull this off for about 450 to 500 bucks. For 950 to 1,000 or so, you can have a setup that is professional sounding, and you can do commercials, for example, or, or work that will actually be usable. That it's, that it's air quality. That is really cheap for what we're doing. We're really creating things. You know, not long ago that studio would be a hundred thousand dollars, and now for a thousand or so, you've got air quality broadcast quality audio coming out of probably your home or apartment. By the way, it looks like Scott's still on the line. Scott, if, if, if you want to tweet, did I answer some of the things you were, uh, your questions about SoundCloud? If you want to tweet that just to uh, uh, put me at ease. Um, and so this is uh, the last chance for live questions. If you have a, a question. Hello. Hi. How? Hey, uh, this is Homer uh, right outside D.C. Oh, hey, hey now, now uh, Homer, uh, uh, Harlan Homer is, is actually one of our students this year, right? Is oh, that correct, great. Homer? Yes, that's correct. Great. Yeah, so you've already signed. You've already signed up. You know, we don't we don't want to you know, waste any time talking to you because we've already <laughs> taken your money. And uh, okay, no, what's up? What's up, Homer? Well, uh, I uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, if it's too early to ask this question, but it, 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 um, I guess what I'm trying to get at is uh, how do you how do you approach like if if, if I'm going to do the door to door type of thing and approach companies that may use uh, voice actors, how do you I guess uh, approach a company like that without without you know getting you know thrown out by a right. security guard or something. Well, I, I think that, and you're right. We we are going to be you know covering that much more in depth uh, when it comes to marketing and getting work. But it goes back to a, someone asked a similar question earlier in this call, and it always starts by identifying the problem that you can solve for someone. Let's say that. 
there is a company, there's a business in your town that has, uh, there's a publicly held business in your community, and you live outside of Washington, there are you know, thousands, and they have an annual stockholders meeting, and you've done a tiny bit of research, and you've discovered that at their stockholders meeting, they have a video presentation that's narrated, and it's narrated by somebody in-house. The problem that you can help solve is they've got a stockholders meeting and they really want to make a good impression on their stockholders. The entire point, I mean, they do it because they're required by law, uh, but beyond that, the entire point is to reassure the stockholders and to get the current board reelected and let them do whatever it is that they've been doing. And so the, the problem that you're going to help solve is how can you really wow your stockholders at your annual meeting because right now they've just been hearing, you know, your assistant uh, reading, you know, yeah, you know, reading the copy. And so h how do you approach that person? Well, you just, you, if you have a contact at the company, you call them. If not, you just call, you know, the main number and you, and I haven't researched this. And, and this is, you know, this is something, if I had researched, I could give you a much snappier answer. So you're looking for the marketing director, the training yeah, director. It, it might be you the know, marketing director. It's very easy I, to get names. Nobody yeah, else would, is doing it. I don't know whether it's the marketing director or there might be somebody within the company who traditionally it's their job to handle the stockholder meetings. And maybe that's not part of the marketing. Maybe that's a, a different department. could but, be the meeting planner. They have departments yeah, for that. There's a lot I of do, research and a lot of possibilities, too. So what I do know is I can make one, maximum two phone calls to companies just to ask. Say, look, I'm just trying to find out. I'm not trying to sell anything. I don't even want to talk to them. I'm just trying to understand, in your business, who is it who puts on the annual stockholder meeting? Like, what department is that? And they might say marketing or they might say uh, investor relations or, like, yeah, let's say they say investor relations. Okay, great. And, and what's the title of the person in investor relations? Oh, that would, that would be the vice president of investor. Okay, great. Now we know whose problem you can solve, and that's who you contact, and you just start a conversation. You do just the barest amount of research, just enough to know who you're talking to. I've had people call me. And, you know, they, they see me on the Internet, and my, you know, my name comes up you know, if you Google radio or something or, you know, morning shows or whatever. And they'll call up and say, yeah, uh, yeah I saw your name online. Um, uh, I, I wrote a book, and I was uh, wondering if, if you have a, a radio show that you might want to interview me for. It's like, that's, that's the opposite of what we want you to do. And it's not difficult to put, put a little effort. And, Harlan, I, I'm sorry, I hear, I hear me getting on the soapbox again. I guess it's – You are. It, it's because I know – Almost everyone is intimidated by the idea of marketing, of picking up the phone. Well, yeah, and, I mean, we, you and I have debated that term because I, I, I've been convinced that the word marketing was convinced because everybody was afraid of the word selling. Um, ah. <laughs> well, it doesn't sound – we're not selling, we're marketing. Well, you're selling. Come on. But you're, you're the, back to what we keep saying, you're, you're, you're fulfilling a need somebody has. We're getting into a lot of detail, but you know, one of the things that we've talked about in the class every year is and I do a little annual survey. Uh, driving on the four major expressways here in Chicago. So then I'm just taking corporate. Now, let's say that some of you will be interested in doing corporate narrative-type work. And every year before the class, I go on 290 and I-90 and the, the basic expressways. Um, I can almost do it by rote now. And I note, without leaving the expressway, the corporations I see. Walgreens. Underwriter Laboratories. Abbott Labs, Baxter Labs, Culligan, one after McDonald's, right along the expressways. And many of those companies I've worked for, and I have, you know, I know people that are well enough over the years to call. So every year, I haven't done it yet this year, I will in the next week. And I ask them, who has called on them or even sent you something unsolicited? And generally, it's zero. And there's a lot of actors here, and they're all trying to get voice work, and they're all waiting for the agent to bring it to them. Nobody, you get a comment like, well, other than you, Harlan, nobody calls me or sends me anything. Wow, that's really stupid. But that, <laughs> that, it is. It's just, what are you talking about? They're right there. You go on the, and, you can, and now today with the, with the Internet, let's say, I mean, I'll just say, this, let's say you decided, yeah, you know, I'm pretty good with medical narration. I, I'm, I'm good with that. Let me take a look at Abbott Labs. You go to their website. You know, those, that about us stuff, you'll find Stacy Christie is the training director. Not a secret. She's a nice lady. I know her. I love her to death. You, you, I can guarantee you could call her up with, you know, after crafting the message, which, which I shoot from the seat of the pants. It's not a good idea. Dan's right about crafting that phone message and how you're going to approach Stacy Christie. And 
she will talk to you. She'd gladly listen, you know, take an MP3 with your with your corp. Now, can she go to agents? Has she? Sure. Could she go to voices? One, two, three. Sure. But nobody reaches out. Just the fact you do that puts you head and shoulders above all these other people. And the beauty of that kind of work is, assuming you do a good job and you're a good person to work with, it's like a residual. They will call you back. And I'm going to tell you how, how many times I know I am doing a job and it's really there are people who are better at it than I am from a voice standpoint. But my client is loath to hire somebody else. They don't, they, it's the reverse, Dan. They don't want to. You know, when someone gets something where it's a big, deep, ladies and gentlemen, I can do that, but it's not really my favorite no, thing. But I can no. pull it off. But they'll hire me instead of people I know who would do it better because we like Harlan. He comes, we know he's going to charge us right. He's going to bill us right away. He's a good guy. In, out, laugh, talk about the kids. I don't want to get somebody else in here. They might be a jerk. <laughs> it cuts both ways. It sounds simple. Well, it is simple, but we will hold your feet to the fire that you have to go do it. And once you like, like writing, once you do it a few times, I'm not saying you won't get rejected occasionally. You will, but usually they're flattered. Hell, well, thanks for calling. Yeah, we usually use such and such an agency, or were you with them? Well, I'm with so and so, or not, or whatever. Hey, would it be okay? You know, it's it's a minute long. I've got some corporate stuff. Can I send that over to you? Sure. And a large number of times you'll hear, hey, I like your stuff. That's interesting. You know, we've got this thing coming up next week. Blah, 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 blah. And the other thing about corporate work is if you're working for the training department, it's nothing wrong with asking for referral to the marketing department. You've solved a problem for the training people. You might be able to do something for the marketing people. And that's building a business. That's not a, a, a career where you're up and down or, you know, I guess it's building a business. I don't want to minimize the fear because it is so pervasive. What I want to stress is you have a choice, and this is for anything in life. But right now we're talking about if you want to go for a voiceover business and you're scared. So right now you've got a choice. You can say, boy, I, you know, I've been talking about this for years, or maybe you're working at radio and you've been wanting to go full-time voiceover for years or whatever, and you know, I, I think about this for years and I'd, I'd really like to do it, but I'm afraid. So the difference is, instead of saying, but I'm afraid, which implies, therefore, you can't do it, it's, I really want to do this, and I'm afraid. So I'm going to do it. You know, I'm going to do it even though I'm afraid, rather than I can't do it because I'm afraid. There is no natural law that says you can't do something even if you're a little bit afraid. And, and Harlan, one, and now this sounds like what I'm about to say sounds like I'm, I'm making a sales pitch, and I can only ask our former students to, to back us up, to post something online. Once you're in the class, nobody's scared. You can hear at the, at the end of like the first night's call just the relief that everyone has. Oh wow, you know this this is cool, and and the fear goes away, and then it it just becomes fun. So there are no more uh, hands up for questions. We have a couple of people actually who have signed up, so I don't know why they're on this call, but I'm glad you're here. And yes, that's that, great. That, no, you, that shows great interest in in, in this investment. Where I'm, I'm thrilled by that. I think it's super. Well, and, and so uh, just. Just to those people, a private message to those people, I assume you checked your email today because we sent you the study guides for all of next week. Oh, they got the first one? Okay, yep. cool, good. And it includes that little surprise that we scheduled for Wednesday, Harlan, mm-hmm. a little thing. And so uh, those of you who already are in the class, make, please make sure you check your email and the study guides are waiting for you. I think that's pretty much it. The website is thevoiceoverclass.com. We close registration on Friday of this week. And every year that we do this, at least so far, every year after we've closed registration, we get emails from people saying, oh, gosh, I, I meant to, but I forgot, which doesn't seem to me to be a very good re- reason. But, you know, the dog ate it or whatever the heck it is, won't you let us in? And I think they're kind of surprised when we say, I'm sorry, we won't take your money now. It, it is very discourteous to the people who, who did show up on time, you know, who who – did get there in time, and, and so the minute you start saying, well, I'm going to make an exception for you, and I'm this one, and that, you know. Somebody just raised their hand. Let's do this, because we just say we're going to wrap up. If we can answer this question briefly, we will. And otherwise, whoever's raised their hand, if, if we say, gee, you know what, that would take longer than we have, I hope you'll understand, because we, we kind of officially had reached the end. So any other last things? Um, yeah, I, I don't think so. So if you decided to join us, great. Um, and if you don't, just you know, good luck with your career and and think about what you're doing. Make a plan. Don't don't have a hope career or what's the the other one you said? Uh, I want I don't want a business. Make, make your own luck. So let's see if we can take this last question that just popped up quickly, and then okay. we'll, we'll wrap up. 
Hi, guys. Uh, first of all, I want to say this has been very uh, great information for tonight. This is Tony calling out of Kansas City. Just a quick question. Oh, is there a recording software that uh, you would suggest is better than the other? Uh, I'll take that and take it really quick. Remember that recording software, like, record, well, like computers themselves, have no sound. Okay? The computer only recognizes zeros and ones, so a lot of people. Do you think a Mac or PC sounds better? There's no difference. It's zeros and ones. Now, when those zeros and ones turn into analog and go to speakers, they have a sound. Same thing with software. You know, Pro Tools, let's say, doesn't sound better than Audacity. One's free, one's hundreds and hundreds and maybe even thousands of dollars. The real thing is, what are you, it kind of goes back to thought, what are you trying to accomplish? And if we're doing basic voiceover recording, it's pretty simple stuff. The biggest thing, just like choosing a word processing program, what's intuitive? So my recommendation, you know, and of course it's budgetary things, is if you're interested in, let's say, SoundForge, or I like Adobe Audition, but partially because I learned cool edit and, and Adobe Audition is an extension, you can download almost all the major recording softwares and play with them for free. Usually you won't be able to save a file because they're not stupid. They want you to buy the program. That's a great way to do it. But in terms of sounding better, that's not really the point. What's intuitive? What works for you? Most of us are creating a WAV file or an AIF file, which is just a full, uncompressed file, full fidelity, and then turning it into an MP3 to send off for an audition or sending that full file off to a client. And they all do that just fine. It's just how it works for you. Great. I think we've come to the end. And if anyone ha has gotten something out of this and you're on Twitter, if you want to tweet something, that would be really appreciated. It's at voiceoverbiz, B-I-Z. And it's thevoiceoverclass.com. We close registration on Friday. And if this sounds like something that would be good for you, we welcome you with open arms. We also have this really cool private member site where you're in a community all of a sudden of people helping to support you. And Harlan, how about if we, you have the last words? And I'm going to guess that you will, those last words will be your mantra. My mantra, it's, I think, so important. We, most of us, we're performers, and we look at voiceover as performers, just like any actor does. Oh, I want to be in a play, I want to be on the stage, and I want to perform, which is great. And we say, what, what is the work you do? Well, I speak into a microphone, and I interpret words that other people have written, and I show up on time, and blah, 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 blah. And I, I maintain that's about 2% of your time. Even if you're pretty successful, you spend a very small percentage of your time in front of the microphone talking, and that is part of what you do and part of the work. But the real work, and this is my mantra, the real work of voiceover work is getting the work. That's the hardest part. Uh, if you're a stage actor, you audition over and over and over and over and over ad infinitum with a day job supporting yourself and your family. You finally get the chance to be on stage at the Goodman Theater to play. That's a reward. It's really not work. Yeah, you get paid for it, but it's really not the work. The work was audition, 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 the day job at Trader Joe's. That's the work. So the same thing for us. The work is getting the work. Most of us sit back and hope somebody else will do that work and we can just go play. Well... I wish life were that way. Trust me, having done this for a long time, it's not. So that's my mantra, and that's how I usually leave each class. But the work of voiceover work is getting the work. So if you take nothing away from this tonight, other than we had a good time, keep that in mind. It, it, will, it will make your career and your life so much better, and it is the truth. And Night, we Dan. Wish, we wish everyone the best of luck in whatever it is that you pursue, and whether it's voiceovers or anything if the big thing that's stopping you is that you're afraid because it's new and unknown, you can do it even if you're afraid. And as soon as it becomes familiar, the fear goes away. You can't believe that you waited that long. So whatever it is that is in your dreams, we encourage you to just take that next step. And we thank you for joining us. Harlan, it's been fun, as always. Oh, and on Friday, we'll, we'll, we'll see exactly who, who are, makes up our final roster of the class. So yeah, thank you, exciting. everybody, for joining us. Thanks. Bye-bye.